I'm just pleased that both of you joined us as we are looking to uh, questions of relevance in the future. So thanks for joining me. Glad to be here. Quite the honor to uh, be here sharing the, the screen or the mic with uh, the two of you. We have been uh, using a title for this called Forgotten Relevance, question mark. The, the statement is, is, has been catalyzed out of looking over the industry of the profession, as well as the many institutions uh, in academia that, that prepare talent for the profession and, of course, for other professions as, as well outside of architecture. But our big question that's really in front of us is, what have we possibly forgotten or left behind that was essential to the sustainable, effective practice of architecture in our pursuit of the shiny new, the things that are always out in front beckoning us for their attention? When we look to the the present context, we're finding so often that students uh, are unbelievably skilled in the technological side of practice. They they know how to spin twelve plates on a stick. It's extraordinary to watch what can be done. Um, but we find that in some cases, they may not know how a building goes together, which is kind of what we might call mm. an essential in in practice. There are are many many gaps occurring. And we're thinking we're seeing even a wider, a widening gap between the academy and the professions. And we want to speak into that um, together, all together. Uh, we are going to be speaking with many professionals as well. We have two senior architects uh, who've been in practice for 40 plus years are going to be sharing with their perspectives. We're going to hear from two global engineers who have been in practice for 40 plus years to hear what they, as they look in the rearview mirror of, of the practice of engineering design, mm. we're going to hear from some mid mid term um, architects as they're 20, 25 years in practice. And, you know, where are they in the trajectory of what, where they've come from to where they are, to where they think this is going. And uh, we're going to look back in history at, the practice of architecture over the centuries and see where we are today. But our time here today is with the two of you who are representing on this supercast of ours, the voice of the Academy. And uh, there is no right or wrong answer in our time here together. It is really just an opportunity for us to have a conversation. I think, you know, you've known what we were going to talk about for a few weeks now. I'm sure you have put some thoughts together. So, Francisco, I'm going to ask you um, some opening comments on your thoughts about this topic and this thing we're we're trying to tackle. Well, I, I think there were two uh, the, there were two topics that, that were reached. One of one of it is relevance. Uh, the other one is uh, what have we lost in the search for the for the evasive new thing. Um, I think uh, the, the the second one is uh, you know to make to make a simple answer it's probably craft uh, the law for craft and uh, but but I think you know this uh, if and, and to give you that, that was the short answer the long answer is uh, is uh, you know, when 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 architecture in academia crosses the Atlantic into into the U.S., it does so as a as a Beaux Arts curriculum, where for those five or six years, you knew exactly what you needed to to take and needed to do to become uh, an architect, and, and then you went to you know, try to get the Paris Prize or the Rome Prize and go see the classics, and and then there's a revolution, uh, there's a modernist revolution that that sort of you know intersects. That uh, that 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 happy voyage of the of the Beaux Arts and says, hold on, we're going to do it differently. So now, in those same five or six years, you have to accommodate uh, a little bit of the Beaux Arts and then the the modernist sort of uh, uh, ideas. 
That was challenged then by by Team Ten and the, and the two seminal books in '66 by by Rossi and and uh, and, uh, and Venturi. So then you have to you know you have a little bit of those are some <laughs> modernism and then the postmodern critique, quickly followed by May of '68 and the social aspects of, of architecture, and then you continue that in the latter part of the 20th century with with the, the digital and, and sustainability and and, uh, and the world becoming more urban than. And rural and all of those things are, are are trying to make their way into the architecture curriculum, uh, which has then this uh, this uh, ongoing struggle between what is what is uh, a required course or a required subject, what is a, what is an elective, uh, what is and, and and what becomes an intrinsic part uh, or a necessary part of those four, five, or six years that, that the students are going to spend. In their in their academic training, when all of these things are, are coming into the curriculum, trying to make way for them to be in, in, incorporated, what what do we do with that that was left behind, or it's going to be jettisoned, or it's going to be moved from from the required category to the to the elective category? So so it's a question that that we've been posing ourselves since since the last century, and and that we're dealing with it every every time society or or innovation gives us a, a new wave. Of um, of ideas or elements to uh, to take over. It almost it's just it's a moving target, and instead of it, it and it seems like it's becoming cumulative as opposed to mm-hmm. there being a really strong judgment about what can be left behind, what what can and what what ought not. And I I don't know if that's institutional in the in how those choices are made. We will talk a little bit later about NAB. And the accreditation process, because I think there are some constraints that are put in place that are constraining the academy, uh, and we'll talk more about that. But um, I'd like to hear from Michael. Michael, what are some of your thoughts to kick us off here? Sure. Yeah, and, and thank you, Francisco. I I think that's a great intro. I, I just keep thinking about the fact that we were all in Venice last week at the Biennale, right? And if you know if i'm if i'm looking at that as a real recognition of um sort of the the future of architecture this is the architecture biennale and it was incredible and inspiring but i've thought a lot about how do we prepare students for that right and that's going to be a very different education than if i'm working with um, the majority of you know the firms that our students are going to work with and sort of what their goals are. So this and architecture has always been something that had um, many, many different um, directions that it can go, right? It's a mm-hmm. it's a Renaissance education, and there's many things that people do with that education, which we all love mm-hmm. that fact about the discipline. But you know, I think it's fascinating. I think um, mm-hmm. The, you know, I, I studied at the University of Oregon, and then uh, next month will be 25 years um, since I graduated, and so I'm now head of architecture here, and I'm inviting people back. So we've been having a lot of conversations about what's changed in the last 25 years, and I don't think that our class, you know, we our, our school is very focused on uh, issues of sustainability and has been for many years. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, I think that the, the Biennale it just represents such an incredible um, sort of representation of larger ideas in the discipline. And this question of, of how, how would we be altering our education if we're really thinking about that as a component of the goal? And I think some schools are definitely doing that more than others. We are still very focused on this this odd term of sustainability, which means so many different things. But, um, you know, for us, the big change has been when I was a student, sustainability was really referring to environmental uh, related issues. And now it's as much about social issues and social justice as it is about um, environmental issues. But the... Um, the question of relevance is fascinating, and I, I every time I, I meet with um, 
you know, our alumni, which I find to be incredibly inspiring, I hear a lot about the push to get our students into practice so that they can have that experience in practice, which is critical. But it's this, it is this balance of what are we going to um, sort of bring into our education that inspires our students to think beyond current practice um, and to, to address some of these absolutely critical issues that were brought up by Leslie Loco's curation of the Biennale and the amazing exhibits there. I think we do have to talk about accreditation because that's, uh, I think, you know, you mentioned we'll talk about that. But of course, if we want to be able to prepare students to be architects, then we have to be uh, responsive to that. And that, given given the impacts of cost of education and time, we, we can't just start adding more classes, right? Um, but I think Francisco's point about craft is really uh, a critical one. I had an interesting experience in Venice because I got there and then a couple of days later, I went to visit our Vicenza program. We have 24 students currently in Vicenza staying work in a beautiful old palazzo and, and you know, and they're doing... Um, you know, watercolors and sketching and doing um, very sort of, I would say, traditional architectural work that felt so disparate from what I was experiencing at the Biennale, but is essential for someone to become an architect. And in, in I believe those core skills of being able to look and see. Um, but how do we discount? all of the issues of technology and um you know ai and things that are coming into our world that architects are are we need to be able to engage too so interesting question that's it's it's a wonderful a wonderful theme that we're going to be dealing with here in our conversation because there is no singular point to it is there there it is a very complex web yeah. It, it gets down to a question, though, that I have for both of you. Why did you choose to become architects years ago? What I mean, you were, what, in high school or secondary school, and or maybe it was before then, and you you said, I, I want to design buildings. I want to I change the world. I want to create cities. But what was it that drove the two of you to become architects in the first place? Paco? I dedicate my my days to my hobby. <laughs> uh, I have I have two sons. One now who's studying architecture. The other, but they used to uh, uh, doodle and play with Legos growing up. And said, "Dad, uh, you get paid for this. You know, that, this is what you do for a living. You, you play with Legos and you doodle all day." And said, like, "Yeah, in in, in a <laughs> sense, that's that's what I do. I, I get paid to." Uh, do it on play with Legos, and I and I enjoy it. I enjoy it every day, and there's there's not a day in my life that I feel like I'm like I'm really working. Uh, every every work day is a vacation day, or in, and every vacation day is a is a work day. I it it allows me to have this great balance between uh, being able to practice, being able to teach, being able to write, being able to uh, to direct the school, and I and I. You know that I that I keep saying that I'm even though I've done administrative work for almost twenty years, uh, I keep saying that I'm not an administrator. I'm a designer in an administrative position. So I'm designing programs. So I'm designing solutions. I'm designing alternatives. I'm designing options. I'm designing uh, new futures. And and I feel like the day that I run out of things to design, that's the day that I step down and and go do something else where I can design and and uh, and, and and I have a blast doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Michael. Yeah, I mean, I I couldn't agree more. It's it's something that you know I have students. Of course, all of us have students talking to us all the time about you know should we go into architecture? And I think all of us you know probably say, well, don't don't do it for the money, right? This is not why people go into <laughs> architecture. Um, and if you're and and I often say like if this is something that you're really having to question it may not be for you like this is unless unless there's something you know that that's really solvable that's that's your challenge but if it's this mm. is such a such a passion driven thing and and 
for myself and and most people I know, it's it's this for me very much um, the opportunity to engage with the world around me in a very direct way. To be able to, uh, I remember when I realized when I was I was originally studying to be a therapist, and I had this realization that I just did not want to spend my days in a room as much as I love engaging with people. I wanted to engage with the world around me. And if I was an architect, everywhere I went, I would be learning from that place. It would be like, like Francisco said, that's, that's what we do every day is engage with the physical world um, and the social Mm -hmm. world. And so um, I had always, I had grown up spending my summers on a, 1865 uh, Neo-Georgian farmhouse in Western New York State and constantly sort of rebuilding that. And to me, that was just unbelievably fun. And then when I realized that 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 was sort of a part of architecture, like we were taking room by room and and designing them and changing them and, and you know, developing um, a, a place. And uh, I got very excited about that. And then realizing that I could, um, you know, work with students to help them discover that that's, that, that's pretty fulfilling. Yeah. 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 To pass that on. Right. Yeah. This, there's this dynamic, uh, that I observe looking into this space of the discipline of architecture, the craft of architecture, the profession of architecture, and then what I call the distortion, which is the professionalization of Mm. architecture, right? And I think that there is a conflict going on between the craft and discipline and the professionalization Mm -hmm. of, of this craft and this discipline, which causes us to, to make short-sighted decisions. We're talking about things like responsibilities we were talking about earlier and whether that's the responsibility tied to economics or the responsibility tied to the environment or the responsibility tied to society, all of those things are a part of the discipline and the profession. But when it becomes professionalized, we will shortchange those things to meet, uh, to meet project objectives, sometimes forgetting that that is the goal that is the calling is to be environmentally, socially, and economically responsible um, on a broader basis. And so I think there's this, this, this tension that's in that uh, where we are today. I'm uh, I heard you just say, you know, and I hear so many uh, of, from the Academy say, if you, you don't go into it for the money, and I have to say that good architects who have been in practice 25 plus years, you should go into it for the money. There's a lot of money to be made in this space. There's not a lot of money on the front end, but architects by and large make double, triple, quadruple more than an elementary school teacher after 20 years, 25 years. They, they have to pay their dues on the front end, but if you move on and continue It is a very well-paying profession. And so the problem is, is when that well-paying becomes the goal, that professionalization becomes the goal outside of the, of the discipline, the craft and the responsible expression of the profession there, there's a big bunch of words for you. Uh, What are you going to do with all that? You guys, any responses? Can I hop in here for a sec? So, First of all, I, you know, I just, I track the people I know who I studied architecture with and, you know, again, every, every school is different, every place is different, but some are certainly doing very well financially, but I would say that's a pretty small portion of those who graduate from architecture school, who go on to make the kind of salaries you're talking about. In my experience, I could, I don't know the data on that. I could look at that. Um, I think you can make a good living for sure, and probably better than an elementary school teacher, but it's a very competitive profession. It's extremely impacted by changes in the economy, as we know, and as we're beginning to see happen already, as people are losing jobs in architecture, at least around here. 
Um, so I, I think for those who are passionate about architecture, it's again, that's not a critical thing, but if you're going to go into um, law, you're going to make probably a lot more money. If you're going to go into medicine, you can probably make a lot more money. Um, like if you look at the, the majority of people in those professions, I, I, I want to though pull out your, your term professionalized. Cause I actually have great respect for professions. Um, and I'm very proud to be one of the professions to be an architect as long, you know, with lawyers and with, um, doctors and engineers. And there's just, I think there's, if I remember correctly, a very small group of professions, which are defined by having a code of ethics, right? Right. So we have a code of ethics as mm -hmm. professionals. And I think that's something to be very proud of. What you were talking about, I see more as the commercialization of architecture, where it just becomes a product. And that's, that's what starts to concern me, um, is when all the incredible thinking that happens in the education of architecture and in the history of architecture. Like this is, architecture represents our, our culture. Like the responsibility of creating architecture is enormous, right? We're, we're creating things that represent mm. our culture in a, in a time and place and history. And when that's just done transactionally, that becomes problematic to me right. that's the, that's the concern but i'm i think being a profession is something to be um very proud of actually i i i, I agree with you and that's why i delineated between mm. profession and professionalization sure no i get yeah. you yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 paco some thoughts on this i want to talk a little bit about that front end that you were talking about uh uh because as we as we seem to practice more and, and educate more in a globalized uh, uh, landscape, <clears throat> I, I think the, um, the the playing field is not leveled, uh, and and I think some of our agencies are contributing to that playing field not being leveled, and 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 I would even go as far to say that they're tying the hands of our students behind their backs. Uh, uh, you know, I, I usually like to make this comparison, and, and uh, you know, we're in Italy right now, uh, so, um, and, you know, I know the Latin American system very well. I know the European system very well. I'm not so uh, versed in, in the African or the Asian system, even though I have visited some schools in, in, in Asia and, and in Africa. Uh, <clears throat> but a lot of the schools in Latin America and Europe, you can get an education for free or almost free. Mm -hmm. and, and when you graduate, you graduate already licensed to practice the, the profession. And, uh, and when you graduate, you have a system of competitions where students can, can actually begin to, uh, to get some, some projects at an early stage. And then they start going from smaller competitions to institutional competitions. At the same time that this is happening, our, our students are graduating with, you know, 100, 200, 250,000 dollars of of, uh, of debt of uh, student loans. That's that's a mortgage in a in a system where they have to go into IDP for a few years, take the licensing exam for another few years, pay their dues, working for for firms, and when they finally get all of that process done, they're at the same stage as the Latin American or the European student who just graduated. And, and they don't have that system of, of competitions to get their first few jobs. And, and the few competitions that we have on this side of, of the ocean, which are, you know, either universities or museums or institutions, then they, they, they will invite all those young Latin American and European architects who have won so many competitions at that uh, stage. Uh, and universities will do the same thing. Let's let's offer positions to these young Latin American up and coming and, and Europeans. Uh, uh, so it's you know I, when when I was president of ACSA and, and we had the five presidents meeting with NCARB and NAB and AIA, I talked about this several times, especially with NCARB. I, I call it the NCARB diet. Uh, what they're doing to to some of our kids, and um, you know, I was, I was then no no no, but we do this all for health, safety, and welfare to protect the the profession. And and I'm not I'm not convinced. I mean, I've been a practicing architect for for twenty something years. I still have a small practice. I, I have a meeting with a client back home in Puerto Rico next week to talk about a, a project. So I do I do practice and uh, 
and and I still I, I think this is a it's it's a big deal uh, as we move into the 21st uh, century that the playing field is not level that that the price of education in in the U.S. is is ridiculous the the amount of money that they have to incur in student loans it's ridiculous the amount of time they have to spend proving that they can belong to the profession I think it's ridiculous as as well you know and when all of that happens you know by the time you know they they're they're done with their exams they're done paying student loans they're done with the IDP you know they're, they're they've been swallowed by the by the corporate system by then it's 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 very difficult to move away from that and actually try to change the the system because you're already a part of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i do have an issue with 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 this front end that that you were talking about it's it's not just a front end where where the salary is is not competitive it's it's a front end where 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 the playing field is not level globally mm-hmm. that's really it, interesting yeah yeah it's it's dramatic actually it's yeah. it's um it's a night and day dynamic between the two is it because the governments and municipalities within those other countries mm-hmm. underwrite the education or is it done through both public private enterprise that underwrites these educational models that for some reason the US with all its wealth has chosen not to do what is that what's what's the force behind that i i i think it's in in some countries it's going to be a higher tax rate uh for its citizens uh, so it's going to be a matter of priorities we prefer to have well in their case we prefer to have education and health and and uh, some things that you consider that are important to to a um, to a, a civilized uh, uh society uh, I, I think we had, a, a, you know, the, the university in the U.S., the public university in the, the, the 50s and 60s after after the GI Bill, and, and uh, uh, the, there was a moment where, where education was very uh, affordable, and, and and it was also very accessible. It was trying, it was beginning to be accessible and affordable, and I think the politics uh, then uh, came in, and, and you know, some people were saying, you know, why do we have to pay for more taxes? For this group to get, you know, a freebie and in, in education, everybody should be paying for that, and 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 we see we still see a little bit of that of that debate and discussion going on in in, in the political agendas of the of the twenty first century, thing you know the, this this privilege this uh, uh, group that is that is uh, so so I think it's a, it's a matter of priorities for for society, you know who decides so. If if and it's not just for the citizens. You go now to anybody anywhere. Kids can go to Germany now and and study for free. It's just free. Period. And, and uh, um, we made some decisions, especially after after the sixties in the in the U.S. about you know education and, and about funding higher education, especially the funding public uh, universities uh, like like Oregon or like like Illinois. And, and and I would say that Oregon and Illinois are, are in two states where where the conversations are a bit different than than what's taking place in other states like Texas and, and Florida. Uh, that we're going to be hearing more and more in the next in, in, in the next few, I was going to say years, but probably months uh, uh, ahead. And and uh, uh, I think it's going to be a, an important conversation. I do too. But I also I think what you're touching on is is critical. But even in Oregon, and I think I don't know much about Illinois, but the the support for public education has changed radically at the state level from what it used to be. So, and I, I worked in Ohio for several years, and we used to say we used to be state funded, and after a while, we were simply state located because the funding was so low for for public education compared to what it had been previously. So, you require if you want to run a university, you require tuition, higher tuition dollars. Um, and for many, it ends up being sports and, you know, other things that are um, not necessarily what the university was built upon, essentially, um, at least its educational model. You know, I, I worked in Denmark for two years when I graduated. So I was in that European model where it was a free education. I was considered an architect when I got there. And um I was just fascinated by this difference. And I remember talking to the people I was working with quite a bit about that. And um, and I was really trying to understand like how that worked because I had been, it had been explained to me that 
I had to go through, you know, three years of IDP. I had to pass at the time. It was nine exams I had to pass, you know, all, all of this. And then, um, and so I, I was talking to, I worked at this great firm called Ewell and Frost, and I was talking to Fleming Frost. And, and uh, I said, well, I, I don't understand, like, what happens if you're not a good architect, if you don't know what you need to know? He said, well, you won't get work. And, <laughs> you know, and. I said, well, what about issues of litigation? If you don't know, you know, if you put bad details on a project or something like that. And he said, well, and it was around this time I noticed that the drawing sets were much, much smaller. And he said, well, you shouldn't be doing the detailing anyways. He said, we have builders who know how to do that really well. So we work with them. We explain our design intent and then they figure out how to build that. And and in the end, it you know, I said, what happens if it leaks or something? And knowing I'd already seen metal, many legal cases at firms I'd worked at, and, you know, he said, well, you get everyone together and you go out to the project and you figure out how to get it resolved. And, you know, I think that the the status of, of litigation, the role of litigation yeah. and the construction practice and, and uh, you know, all of ACE overall is is impacting things a lot. I think that's part of what's behind this. Mm -hmm. But I do think if we want to really make this a profession that is welcoming to all, everyone in our society, things are going to have to change. It's, it's absolutely becoming um, more and more challenging uh, to afford the cost of education. And then, you know, the cost of living when you get into, I mean, all the, all the factors that have changed that make it more challenging to take on this this kind of financial burden. I think it's interesting that NCARB, um, and you may know more about this, Francisco, but I know that NCARB has been allowing more and more states to allow licensure without having a degree in architecture again. This is something that used to exist, but I thought that had that was not occurring. I found out recently there's, I think, 13 states where you can now get licensed without a degree in architecture. You have to have more years of practice experience, but um, I, I think that's interesting to see that on the rise and it's inevitable uh, if we want to allow people into the profession who who are not able to uh, you know, address the cost of education, that time and that financial burden. I've, I've had my issues with, uh, with NCARB. Um, uh, that would be a whole different conversation. We could dedicate this, you know, the, the whole <laughs> conversation to to that. And I know you want to talk about NAB, and I've had some issues, some more recent issues with with NAB and and what they're trying to do or not doing. Um, so we can we can talk about that. All all, all I'm going to say is that that you know the, we have these collaterals, right? That's how they're called. And and um, you know when when I was president of ACSA, we had I think we had an office with seven, six or seven people in DC, and and uh, NAB had you know around the same six or seven people in an office. AIAS had three or four. Um, NCARB had, had over a hundred. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it it really is uh, 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 you know it's a money making operation, right? So and, and it protects itself. So let's talk about NAB because, you know, I, I hear, you know, that it's easier to get accredited as a medical school than it is an architectural school in the United States. I mean, the, the level of rigor that is necessary that, that you folks have to, uh, I'll call it the hoops you have to jump through, uh, the time that it takes, the drain on the on the staff, uh, the faculty, the organization to pull this off when it comes around. My question is, is who is making those decisions? Um, how, uh, how shall I say, how coordinated, aligned, collaborative are the accreditation requirements with the academy? Or is it is it being done to the academy or with the academy? May I ask that question? We we just had an, an, an accreditation visit at, at Illinois this this semester and uh, uh, it was the new system whatever they call it the 
2020 was conditions. Related, and, as, as I was finishing my, my, not my year as president, but my year as past president, so I was part of some of the discussions and mainly against the, the new system uh, for several reasons. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, you, you have, I mean, you have done this for a long, long time. I, I, I did accreditation visits in, in Puerto Rico with, with very little resources that we had there, very successful accreditation visits. Uh, and uh, but I knew exactly what the conversation was going to be. I, I have no idea what the conversation is going to be now. It's it's completely you know, it could be about anything. They're, they're they're not really talking about what you're doing or how you're doing it, but how you are assessing what you're doing. And uh, and nobody here is an expert at, at, at assessment or assessing or making decisions based on, on on assessment. We're not even educators. We're we're professional architects within a professional school embedded within a professional school in, in, in a university. You know, uh, I remember telling somebody in, in my previous job as an administrator, you know, after a, 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 a successful accreditation visit, then they wanted me to do a, a self-study as I visit. I can, you know, I, I, get, I have time to do what I do and I have time to tell you about it, but I don't have time to do both. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of meant as a, as a as a joke, but 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 it's the truth. I, I feel like right now we're doing a lot of things, and uh, and we have to do a lot of things. And, and I'm and I'm clear. You know, after after writing the book on on architectural pedagogy, I have and, and spending you know eight years, uh, nine years as a dean before, and, and and three at the ACSA board, I have a pretty good idea of what of what I want to do, and we're implementing that. But the conversation in the accreditation was had nothing to do with with pedagogy. It had nothing to do with with any of that, it, it it was about you know assessing the assessment and and uh, and, and, and have some serious issues with with, with that. Uh, having said that, uh, when I was at ACSA in, in, in some of those meetings, I remember somebody saying that if if NAB weren't doing the accreditation, that NCARP would take over that role. And if it's not in card, I've, I've had some conversations within the university that somebody in the university will will do it. If you're not doing that, that job, which the university recognizes that you have, you have as a professional school, you have an entity like NAP doing it. If it weren't for that, the university would find somebody to do that job within the university to to assess, you know, what you're doing. So. You know, given given everything, all the the, the possibilities that that that. Could be happening. I'd rather have a group of architects and educators having a discuss, engaging in a conversation with with us. But I think the conversation that we're having it is not a positive conversation that will build on a better school, or will or will talk about issues of relevance in the twenty first century where we're heading. You know, whether whether architecture. And, and innovation and discovery is going to happen because of us or in spite of our best intentions. None of that is on the is on the table. Mm. Mm. It's really about check marks and and uh, so uh, you know I, I I really wish it was. I mean I'm in favor of everyone every so often uh, having a conversation about and and we we brought in some external reviewers to to do a process and and to talk engage in a conversation about where we were and what we were doing, what we were doing wrong, what, what we could do better. And I felt that was a was a more uh, productive conversation than, than the one we, we recently had. Uh, but but I, I do believe in, in in looking at yourself and, 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 and improving. I just don't think this system is doing it. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, I, can I can I follow up on that, Dave? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know I was um I went through accreditations in architecture while I was in Cincinnati for 12 years, um, but I wasn't leading them. And then I went to University of Texas at Arlington, where I was uh, director of the architectural engineering program. And I was in civil engineering for a few years. And it was a new program, started a few years before I got there, and I had to take it through accreditation. And learning about um, ABET, the Accreditation Board of Engineering and Technology, was so surreal for me as an architect because they couldn't care less about student work or what you were producing. It was it was all about assessment. It's purely about saying, what is the mechanism you're going to use to assess this and that, and what's the benchmark? And, and then you had to prove that you were doing that. And then I came to Oregon 
in March of 21 and our accreditation document was due in September. Mm -hmm. And um, the faculty had done a lot of work, but the assessment piece had really not been understood. We were one of the first schools under the 2020 conditions and procedures. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just absolutely fascinating to me because it felt like they had basically taken the ABET accreditation for engineering and brought it to architecture. And I'm very critical of it um, for certainly the reasons that that um, Francisco is bringing up. I also am, am an advocate for it in certain ways, though, because I think that architects, especially academic architects, are really good about having discussions about what we believe should happen. I think in my experience, we're not as good at saying, how do we know if we've succeeded at that? And how do we measure what that success looks like? And so I think that this focus on assessment can be really productive if it's put to work effectively. But I don't feel like our accreditation that we went through last year really did that. Um, but I think my hope is that, and, and, and again, we were one of the first schools to go through and it, it, it went well, but I think it went well in part because I don't know if NAB really knows what they're looking for with this either. Um, so my hope is that we've had some great conversations amongst the faculty about saying, well, let's step back and not worry about the checkboxes so much, but actually start to figure out what are the ways we would figure out if we are, you know, if our students are having the successes that we want to have, if our program is having the successes that we want to have, beyond just saying, we think we're doing great, or we don't think we're doing well here. Um, you know, I, I I think that it's it's not what architects tend to do, uh, just mm -hmm. like you said. Um, but I, I think for us, it's been an interesting series of conversations. We're still continuing to have. We've chosen, you know, NAB presents this huge, you know, sort of Excel spreadsheet about all the things you need to assess and how, and and we've decided to simply focus on a very particular subset of that and really take that on to see if that can be more meaningful for us this year and next year. Uh, so we'll we'll see how that goes, but. I am one to often defend assessment as a concept if we're putting it to work in ways that are helpful for us. I'm going to ask a, a, a naive question. Who is NAB accountable to? As, as a, technically they're one of the five collaterals, but they respond to other three collaterals. They respond to ACSA, uh, AIA, and NCARD. Okay. And they and, have members of all three. Okay. And 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 who is NCARB accountable to? Uh, the I guess it, it would be the the in Puerto Rico would be the Secretary of State, so okay. whoever whoever's in charge of the of the law. Okay, the different state legislatures, yeah. uh, et cetera, and, 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 okay, in representing that. Um. It, it seems like um, uh, there needs to be kind of a whistle blown on the outside coming in. I look at it there. What are the problems we're trying to solve? And I think we've almost created such a complexity in this, in this network of representative bodies that I'm not sure we all would agree what the problem is we're trying to solve through accreditation, through mm -hmm. licensure, through, uh, through these dynamics at the end of the day, uh, ACSA is is really the representative body of the academy, mostly, um, and it seems like there should be a leading voice from the academy uh, to contribute. First of all, how how does it view licensure into the future, and how does it view accreditation as a unified body, and uh, and then what are we willing to be held accountable to in that accreditation? In other words, seems like there needs to be a more holistic conversation, a dialogue around this. And uh, as I travel the industry, uh, there's a lot of finger pointing, you know, of different things. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how we get past this because it's debilitating at the end of the day. This is not, this is not life engendering. It's debilitating to the, 
to ultimately the students mm-hmm. who are passing through? I think it goes back to the question of, of, of you know, relevance and time and and, uh, and and the speed of uh, things are moving in the 21st century, at least at this point in the 21st century. Uh, whereas I think the university is still obsessed with the, you know, with with its its moment of heyday in the in the 20th century. Uh, you, you know, the the with the uh, the GI Bill and the and the Pell Grant and that large institution, you know, publicly funded and. And, and where where things you know the university was was still supplying a lot of the research that that created that produced discovery and and, and change uh, and innovation and professors could be in a university for thirty years and, and basically still teach the same thing between you know nineteen seventy five and, and nineteen ninety five those twenty years twenty five years I think that's completely changed uh, right now uh, and that's why I, I, I said you know. A lot of the innovation and discovery is taking place in, in private think tanks outside of the, the university uh, that, that move at a different speed. They can digest change at a different speed that we can at this, you know, slow and bureaucratic public institutions with a lot of, com- a lot of committees and subcommittees. And, uh, you know, by, by, by the time we process something, it's time to start processing it again because it has changed. Uh, so, so I don't know if, if you know, we really have to have a conversation right now about, uh, you know, and, and again, that's why the, the conversation that NAB wants to have, I had no interest in, in having because I have an interest in having conversations about how, how we're going to be relevant in five and 10 and 15 years. How we're going to be able to sit at, at the table and, 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 and make decisions or, or being, being invited to the table where decisions are made. And even trying to lead the conversation at, at the table where, where decisions are uh, are made, uh, you know, I know they're talking about AI right now and and uh, and, and, and all of that, and and, uh, and I'm not exactly sure that 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 we're sitting down and having that conversation. I think I think we're still looking back five or ten years ago the things that happened. And we wish that had happened differently as opposed to turning around and thinking about five, 10 years down the road and, and seeing how we're going to make those decisions that in the theater of life, you know, we're, we're not going to be spectators, that we're, we are going to be able to write the script. We are going to be able to be actors and and, uh, and we are going to be able to to design the, uh, the, the, the scenery uh, as opposed to just being spectator of what somebody else will be will be doing, I think that's an important conversation. I don't think it's happening. I don't see it. You know, I don't see people talking about it anywhere. I see a lot of the people who are who are, who are uh, taking you know these positions are are either too you know too fresh to to understand what they're getting into, or 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 too old. You know, just to be thinking, this is my last gig before I, before I retire, and, and I don't want anybody coming in and and and, and shaking things things up. Uh, we're in, we're in institutions where where the alums exert some power and influence, and and they're, and they're interested in a mo- in a particular moment in history. I, I think the university then may be interested in the future, and I think students are interested in in an ever present present for them you know what you create for them at this very moment it's a it's a, it's a complex thing to to juggle between memory and desire uh, but I think at some point uh, you know I'd like to be able to uh to find a a group of leaders who are, who are willing to talk about what the future five 10 15 years from now is going to be and 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 we're interested in writing what that future will be in and making sure that that it's implemented. Yes. And as you know, at Design Intelligence, this is what we're given to. And so that's yeah. why we've teed up this conversation. We're focusing on relevance, not relevance in the rearview mirror, relevance out the out the windshield. And we're looking at a new alignment between society, the academy, and the professions that come out to then circularly serve that society and ensuring that there is the most effective but also efficient way to to create that circular dynamic of responsibility this is so important to the future we have been we have been for too long in a in a general sense irresponsible on too many dimensions 
uh, wound up, uh, I often call it being obsessed with our shoelaces, looking down as opposed to looking out and what needs to be occurring. I'm going to close this conversation. This has just been a, I love this kind of conversation. I wish we could do this. We actually should. We should just get together and sit for a whole day with some like-minded and some odd-minded people, and let's come together and have this big conversation. But to close this, I do want to ask, as I began with, when you look at this continuum of the past and what was radically relevant and where we are going, have we forgotten, have we lost some things in our pursuit of the future that we should have been bringing forward with us? There's many things I'm sure we should have let go of and, and, and abandon over time, but sometimes the rule of the baby in bathwater plays. We end, up, we end up throwing things out we should not have. And I'm wondering, when you look at the future of this, this world of, the, of what society is radically needing, of what the academy can prepare for and what the profession can then deliver, what do we need to go back and bring forward? That would be my question. I, I don't know if the answer is in the in the past to, to bring forward. Uh, I think uh, I think we should not be taking for granted that uh, that there's always going to be a, a you know a, a, a duty or a task for us when when we graduate. And it's always going to be the same. I, I think in my own practice, whenever I go and sit on that project table. In 20-something years, I've seen more and more people sitting down at that table, project managers, specialists, uh, uh, all sorts. So, so it's, it's, they're diluting more and more a role in that, that table until one day we're going to go to that meeting and they're going to ask us what we're doing there. And they're going to say that we're no longer needed in the, in the meeting. They, they're taking care. They have some aesthetic cons- consultant that, that, is, that, that is going to be doing what, what we do. So, so I don't think we should take it for granted. I, I think we should, uh, you know, the role as, as, as architects and, and what we, Michael, and, and you talked about the, the, in the beginning of this conversation of, about what we do well and what we, what we enjoy doing it and what we bring to the table about, about shaping the world, about sustainability, about understanding, you know, making a difference and leaving a place better than the way we, we found it. I think we should not take for granted that 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 is always going to be a role. I think I think we're going to have to fight for it. I, I think we're going to have to uh, to to always sit there and 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 convince and enroll people in 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 a vision. So we're going to have to be eloquent and articulate uh, uh, in a way that the schools are not doing because we're we mainly do presentations, you know, to other architects. And convince other architects that what we're doing is is uh, is interesting, and, and I think the the key here is to be able to have that conversations with with others, with politicians, with bankers, with developers, with consultants, with engineers, with everybody who sits at that table, and let them understand that 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 we are relevant, that we are necessary, that we we are the ones who are going to be synthesizing everything that takes place in, in that table. And, uh, and 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 again, not not take it for granted because I'm I'm sure there are a lot of people at that table who think that we're not necessary. Uh, we, we even think that that we're a burden to to the project or to the uh, to the process. So 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 I'm going to summarize because I love what you just said. But at the end of the day, we we have been giving up our role of leadership over a long period of time. And it's time for us to recover that leadership, not to bully our way to the table, but to be seen as so essential to the conversation that they don't start the conversation till they look around and make sure the architect is at the table. There was a time when the architect served as the master conductor of these conversations. Mm -hmm. And that has been, over time, um, uh, eroded. And um, there are many reasons. And we... And we have the education to do that in, in a university where, where most where all of the all of the majors, all of the disciplines are strictly about the world of the sciences or the world and, and technology and the worlds of the arts and the humanities. Architecture is really the only one that, that synthesizes 
both of those worlds in 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 a discipline. So it, it's by definition it's multidisciplinary, and so so we can be the translators of of that conversation that takes place in that table. We're we're prepared to do that. We just we just need to be aware that that we are understand that 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 we have the right education to do that. I think as a as a profession we need to communicate much more effectively our our value yeah and i think that what you're both saying is exactly right what we bring that's absolutely unique is the capacity to weave many different things together towards a shared goal right design true design and i don't think that there's other disciplines that do that nearly as well as we do and i think our the 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 core of our education is set up for that in many ways the you know the studio education model which has been picked up in other disciplines now because it's so valuable in terms of what how that prepares students uh, you know and for group work and for understanding how multiple disciplines engage a, a a single project but i i i think the the question of relevance is most critical in terms of mm. our role at the table as you're both bringing up in the future and how we make sure that um, we communicate to society and to governments and to other professions the value that we do bring, which is essential for our success. Wow. Wow. Thanks so much for taking time on this uh, kind of holiday day to come in and, and do this. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.